Our mission is to connect our community, to provide information, great music, and a forum for the free exchange of ideas. This year, KHOL was one of five radio stations across the country to partner with StoryCorps on the One Small Step initiative. One Small Step brings strangers with different political views together for a conversation. Not to debate politics, but to get to know each other as people. And here in Jackson Hole, we've had nearly 100 people sign up. The program is based on contact theory. The idea that a meaningful interaction between people with opposing views can help turn thems into us's. We have partners from across Jackson Hole who shared this opportunity with their constituents. The Teton County GOP, the Teton County Democratic Party, as have the religious communities of St. John's Episcopal Church, the Jackson Hole Jewish community, the Presbyterian Church, and Our Lady of the Mountains Catholic Church. Each group is encouraging their members to participate in a one small step conversation. We're also fortunate to partner with the Wonder Institute at the library and use, and use their recording studio, and also with the Center for the Arts in their communal space here on the other side of the building. Political division in the United States is not new. It's something that even George Washington warned about. But a flash forward today, we have elected officials screaming at each other. We have celebrities and influencers screaming at each other. And many of us, scrolling on the internet, consumed by it all. In a CBS YouGov poll, half of respondents said the biggest threat to our way of life is other Americans. Might that be because we don't know people from the other side? Here in Jackson, many of your neighbors are Democrats. 66% are registered Democrats. We don't quite live in a bubble like, say, people in San Francisco County, the bluest county in the country, but we can't quite say that our neighbors are politically diverse either. There's a zip code 30 miles away from here where only 16% of the residents are Democrats and 84% are Republicans. And that homogeneity in American communities is pretty common. One in three Americans are almost completely isolated from the opposite party, geographically and rhetorically. And it's a lot easier to demonize people on the other end of the spectrum if you don't personally know many of them. And that's not a good situation for our country. So how do we change this? Well, we have to get curious. And that's why we're bringing people together in conversation. We hired Allison Sperry to help lead this effort to recruit participants and record them in conversations. Many of you may know Allison through the Sister Cities Project where she brought people from Jackson and Tulescala, Mexico and worked with them to teach them documentary film. For this, she received a Fulbright Fellowship and she received her, M her MFA in Media Arts from the University of Montana. Allison is a connector and a really good listener. And so before we get to the main act tonight, I'm going to invite Allison up, and she's going to talk a little bit about the structure of a one small step conversation, how she pairs people, and how the questions are asked. And listen closely, because there are probably some tips about how to be curious that we can all apply in our own lives. Let's give a warm welcome to Allison. Okay, so just to begin, um, why are you interested, or why were you interested in being part of this program? Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I miss these kinds of conversations in my life today. Um, and I remember when I used to have them. I grew up in a household with parents who saw the world very differently from one another. Um, and so conversations on both sides were in my brain and in my DNA from the beginning. Um, and at various points in my life in communities where I've lived, I've had those conversations. I've had friends from across the aisle and more and more here I don't. Um, so I was immediately drawn to this project because it's encouraging that, because it's seeking that out. So what is the structure of a one small step conversation? How do you even begin? How do you decide who to pair? Ooh, how do we decide who to pair? Um, 
I, everyone who signs up, I follow up with um, in, over the phone. I go through their application and I ask them deeper questions as to the things that they've already answered. When they sign up, they are identifying where they um, fall on the political spectrum between conservative and liberal. They're also identifying the importance of religion in their life. Um, and they're asked some questions about their life experience. And so with that information that comes to me, you know, as a data sheet, I call those folks up and I ask them questions that bring them to life as a person. And I ask them questions that won't come up in a one small step conversation with their partner, um, but instead people are willing to share their belief systems in a way that, um, that is more revealing or more telling um, that allows me to find those themes and those important notes that um, are common between them and ultimately their partner. So I'm looking for um, life experiences, uh, places where they've lived, um, their, uh, their issues of importance to them, and all of that uh, is ultimately like those little nuggets that help me see the connections between folks. Um, and some of it, I would say, I go back and I look at those notes, and I want to see, um, I, I want to find those common grounds that ultimately will come out in their conversation. And so they're not actually in a debate, they're in a conversation. Can you talk about the structure of a one small step question and how it might be different from, say, a debate? Ultimately, I think people are coming into these conversations preface that it's about expressing their curiosities. Um, you're probably sitting down with someone that you don't know, whereas I did have a conversation earlier today between two folks that did know one another. Um, but the goal is that you're not assuming to know anything about someone. Um, you're given a little bit of background information that people provide uh, when they sign up and writing their own bio. But otherwise, I hope that people are uh, leaning into their curiosity to know more. And a lot of it, the questions are framed in the how did you come to this place rather than why. Exactly. So uh, we, the questions that folks are given come from StoryCorps for the most part, and they are all open-ended questions. Um, and they're the same questions that they, uh, one another asks. So let's invite um, our two guests tonight. We have Jim Rooks, Council Member Jim Rooks, and uh, former Mayor Pete Muldoon. And they're going to have a one small step conversation. We're going to model this for the audience. Um, and just for full disclosure, Allison is in a relationship with Pete Muldoon. And Jim Brooks has had a one small step conversation previously, so he's familiar with the structure. Um, but this is their first conversation since the 2020 election. So let's give them a warm welcome. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for being willing to have this conversation. Uh, and thank you for doing it for our community. I think this is really important uh, for all of us. So we're going to dive right in. Um, but I do want to establish that StoryCorps, after years of doing this project, um, has established some ground rules. Um, and I'm going to lay that out here for us to have as reference. Um, but first and foremost, we're going to refrain from using any harmful or derogatory language. Um, we agree to share the time equally, like a tennis match. Uh, it doesn't go very well if one person's hogging the ball and it's stuck on one side of the court. If I feel like you're talking and waxing on a little too long, I'll throw that on the table. Okay. <laughs> uh, as a gentle reminder, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to make sure we use it judiciously. Um, thirdly, we're not going to interrupt each other. I know we get excited. I do at least and jump in. Um, uh, I'm going to ask that you don't make assumptions about what you think you might know about your partner. Instead, and I think this is important for all of us, get curious. Um, ask them about it. Uh, I'm going to ask you to speak for yourself and about your own experiences rather than for all elected officials or all men in Teton County. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you to respect each other's differences, first and foremost. We're not here to persuade each other. All righty. 
Thanks, you guys. Any questions before we get started? Wonderful. For the sake of the archive, um, as all of these conversations will be entered into the StoryCorps archive and the Library of Congress, um, please read what you have there on the card, identifying who you are, where we are, and who you're with. Jim, do you want to go first? Yeah, my name is Jim Rooks. I'm 52 years old. Um, today's date is November 1st, 2023. We're in Jackson, Wyoming. My interview partner is Pete Muldoon and relationship to partner, one small step. And I'm Pete Muldoon, I'm 50 years old. Uh, today is November 1st, 2023. We're in Jackson, Wyoming. My interview partner is Jim Rooks and uh, our relationship is, we are sitting here at a one small step program. Perfect. All right. I am gonna do my best not to say much at all here because this conversation is between the two of you, for the two of you. Um, so I'm sort of the wizard behind the curtain, providing you with questions that you will ask of each other um, and look at one another, talk to one another, and try to pretend like I'm not here. <laughs> and none of these people are here either. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pete, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, I suppose I'm asking this question of Jim. Yeah. Uh, what made you want to have this conversation today? Well, I love KHOL, community radio. I like StoryCorps a lot. Um, I think I was just looking earlier today, I think it's 20 years old. Um, I come from a long line of storytellers. My wife's here, she can confirm that. I think there's a lot of power and dialogue. Um, I would, had a great conversation via Small Step with J.P. Trudell, who I think is um, right over here. I very much appreciated that experience, and um, I was asked to be here. So I try. If someone asked me to be part of something, I I want to say yes, and I specifically wanted to talk to you. Um, I thought uh, originally when we were talking about um, partnering people up, I was like, man, I, Pete and I would make a great thing. So I was happy to talk to JP. Uh, truly appreciated that time. But specifically, I thought it would be um, an authentic, like, important conversation. Great. Uh, what made you want to have this conversation today? Well, um, Allison asked me to. It was the first thing. I usually <laughs> smart enough to do what she tells me. Um, but I, I do think that uh, dialogue is important. And, you know, you and I had, a, I think we had a walk around town during our campaign for 45 minutes. And I think that was about the only interaction we'd had. And I... I'd met you before a handful of times in the paragliding days, yeah. maybe in Maddie Combs' backyard, but didn't know you, and we hadn't had uh, any opportunity really to, to have a conversation during that campaign, the way it turned out, other than I think we all know debates are not conversations. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, there, is a, there are things that we say and do when we're, uh, when we're involved in politics that... Um, are driven by the realities of the job and what we're, tr and what we're trying to do. And, and I think it's not, I don't think politics is really designed to try to, for people to try to get to know each other in a, in a real way or to understand them beyond a kind of transactional way, if that makes sense. So I thought this was an opportunity to do that. Um, and I'm glad to be here. And I've done StoryCorps once before a couple of years ago and I thought it was great. You want Start. To first? So this is Pete's bio. I was raised on a military. I was raised on military bases before joining the military myself. Moved to Jackson 23 years ago, and have worked in a very eclectic range of fields during my life. I recently completed a degree in political science, and I'm currently working as a musician as well as a residential contractor. Anything that you're curious about? Yeah, I've always been curious um, about your military background. So you know. First and foremost, thank you um, to you and your family. Um, but I was curious about, like, you know, what branch of the military were you in? What did military service look like for you? Yeah, um, well, I grew up and, and lived on Air Force bases growing up, my whole life moving around. My dad was a, he joined, he was an Irish immigrant, and, and the military is the place you go when you're an immigrant. So that's where he ended up. And uh, it was a large family and, and not much money, and my dad 
for some reason, he was in the Air Force, he encouraged me, he thought, he thought the Army would be the right branch to be in, which is a lot more difficult than the Air Force. I don't know why he thought that. So I signed up on my 17th birthday, Army National Guard, I was in the uh, regular Army for the first Gulf War, and then um, uh, well, there was something else about it, I don't remember, but oh, I was a truck driver, I was an 88 Mike. I okay. drove trucks back and forth. I did not go over to, to Iraq. I drove trucks back and forth from Fort Polk to Fort Hood, Texas. So that was it. Yeah. Thanks. Your turn. Uh, well, this is Jim's bio. Um, I'm a fifth generation Jackson Hole native. I have a bachelor's degree in secondary social science education and a master's in public school administration. I've been a, a classroom teacher, a principal, and athletic coach for the last 28 years. I'm married and have two teenage children. I currently so serve on the Jackson Town Council and am the executive director of the Wonder Institute. Um, I, 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 that's probably not, <laughs> what I want to ask you is, is how's it going? <laughs> 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 you know, I know it's not really about the background, but it kind of. It's, yeah, you know. it's, it's going great, generally speaking. Um, it's interesting from that bio till now, I, um, you know, you know so well that this, uh, this public service job called town council, especially the mayor, um, but I was confronted with the volume of work associated with that. I knew it was a full-time gig, I'm used to that, but it's, uh, it's like two, two jobs in one week and then a quarter job, you know, so it was hard for me to balance, so I'm no longer the executive director of the Wonder Institute, um, I just resigned from the Wonders Institute. I'm on their board. Gotcha. I still do some of the work that I used to do um, as an employee of the Wonder Institute. Um, but I guess that's one way to say how's it going is that there's a lot there, balancing a lot of balls. And I finally, after three years on town council, thought that I should probably, I don't think I can continue to try to do both. Um, so I happy to be involved with the Wonder Institute this day. Happy to hear that they're part of this organization or this endeavor, um, but yeah, it's good, and it's, as you know, it's a lot of work. Three years already. Yes, three Fly years, yeah, apparently, flies, yes. I kind of was taken aback by that when you said yeah. that. I guess it has been three years. Well, well, people are starting to ask me about what my future plans and politics are, so it must be, I'm not there must you. be an election. <laughs> <coming up laughs> well, this is the chance right now to put Jim to the, give him the question. I don't know. I don't remember whose turn it is, isn't it? It doesn't. But sure. Why did you decide to run for public office? Um, yeah, this one this is kind of personal. You can imagine, like, I could just give, like, this basic thing for why a lot of people run. But um, fundamentally, I got hurt, right? I got ran over. And uh, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, even though this might seem like the most generic question, for me, it's, like, a tough one because... I, I didn't really. I'd still be teaching. I love teaching. Um, that's kind of who I am. Um, everything that drives me. And so I got hurt. I couldn't teach anymore. And I needed, uh, I needed to do something, make some money. As we all know in this town, the world doesn't stop turning just because you get hurt. And... Um, so I'm like, what can I do? You know, I taught government social studies my whole life. I've always loved politics, loved government, all the social sciences. Um, I had thought from time to time about maybe running for office um, locally. And, um, but yeah, I basically got hurt. And um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm like, what could I do that I like, can actually physically do, but also benefits, right? And I had tremendous health issues. But, I have a family, I have two kids, so I'm sitting here looking at the chessboard going, what's my next step? And it occurred to me that I, sh I, I could run for office, right? It's in the Wyoming retirement system. You know, I was 25 years into that system mm -hmm. and just trying to, so, you know, I could say a bunch of other things, but it was like benefits um, for myself and my family, uh, retirement in a system that I'd been invested in for so many years. Um, some source of income. Um, so, you know, there's a whole rest of it. Like, I thought that I could help, and I love Jackson Hole, and, 
you know, my great grandmother was on the 1920 All Women's Town Council. Here it was in 2020. You know, so there's a lot of reasons, but um, forgive the emotion, but like, there's only one reason I'm uh, in elected office right now, and that's because I had a, an injury, a set of injuries based on getting run over by a car. And um, if it wasn't for that, I'd still be teaching at Jackson High School, Go Bronx, running the We the People program, doing, doing that. And that's what it's nice for me to be able to do. Um, oh, I thought that was the tennis ball. <laughs> <laughs> it's the guard. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And don't tell my wife about that tennis ball either. Too, that's like, so that's, that's enough, I think, yeah. Um, and what about you? I've always been very curious about this. What, does, um, what made you decide to run, run for office? Well, two things, I guess, and don't let me forget the second one. The first, I, I think, is I also was always interested in politics. I was a political science major, to, at least for a while in college, among a bunch of other majors. Um, it was also always fascinated by politics. I'd written about politics in, for papers. I'd, I'd, I'd followed them. I, I have maybe an unhealthy obsession with our system of government. <laughs> um, and so that got me involved in it. Uh, and at some point, I got in, more involved in local politics. And then it became, I never thought I would run for office. It wasn't something that really interested me. Um, and. You know, things were changing here, and, and I grew up in a, I grew up moving, as I said, all around the country all the time, and, you know, you'd, you'd move, you'd live somewhere for two years, make some friends, and you'd move, and you'd never see them again, and so I don't have, I never had some place to go back to, you know, um, and, and basically all of the friends that I had li lived here in Jackson, and they were leaving, and that sucked, and I was hearing from them, and I felt like I had some of the skills to be able to maybe do something about that. I come from a very, very working class background. Um, and I felt that was part of, that part of the community wasn't being represented as well as it should be. And I think that's kind of natural because it's, it's like that everywhere, right? Like it's hard to be in the, in the working class and run for office. You know that, I mean, I think a lot of local elected officials know that. Uh, that was my main, <clears throat> that was my, that, that's, you know, my reason. The other reason, if I'm being completely honest, is that I want it, I, is, it's, it was an ego thing. I wanted, uh, and I, I don't regret this, but I wanted to accomplish something meaningful in my life. Yeah. And I think that I did. Um, and I think, you know, I heard a, a Martin Luther King quote, quote a long time ago that uh, he said the best thing that we can hope for is that our, the, the, the personal desires and, and goals of our politicians align with the public good. <laughs> Hopefully they did, you know, in my case, but, I, you know, sure, that was a part of it. I, I personally wanted, wanted to accomplish that. Yeah. I wanted to be able to say it did that. So. Thanks. This is a good question here. Um, can you tell me about your experience during the 2020 election? It would be a trigger warning. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't fun. <laughs> um, I did not, I had mixed feelings about running again. I obviously did not, I chose not to, to run for mayor again. Um, uh, that's a decision I don't regret at all. Um, Haley's very accomplished, very, she probably should have had that job instead of me, to be honest. Um, and. But I, and I was not intending to run. I did not, I just felt there were things that were left undone and I didn't, when I was looking at the candidates who had filed when, and I don't recall if, if you were one of them, but who had filed at the time that I had to make a decision or, or made the decision, I felt like I needed to run again. Um, <coughs> at any rate, uh, I didn't put a whole lot of effort into the actual campaign. I figured people kind of knew who I was, they'd like me or they didn't. Um, and, uh, that was going along fine. I didn't have, I wasn't super invested in winning. Um, but obviously some allegations came out against me that were false and those were weaponized by a whole lot of people in the community and that really, really sucked. That hurt a lot. Um, that has made me, you know, I haven't been back to town hall maybe once because I had to go down there and do something, but I haven't, I, you know, it was a job that I cared a lot about and I've, kind of disassociated myself with 
a lot of it I felt maybe incorrectly that um, that my help isn't wanted or wouldn't be helpful, you know, which sucks. Um, and there's the nature of the allegations, you know, bad enough as they are. And then I was um, a, vic a sexual assault victim as a teenager, and so that just kind of made it worse. It was not a. It was a. This wasn't a great time, <laughs> like that. And when it was over, I was ready to leave town. And I'm glad I did not. I'm glad I'm still here. But yeah. Yeah. Tell me about your experience in 2020, Jim. Well, I'm glad you're here too. And uh, yeah, so I kind of mentioned part of it. You know, people were like, "Oh, 2020 is so crazy, COVID, these things, or whatever." But my experience, you know, when I got hurt was in July of 2019. Um, so, uh, you know, you get older, you try to be present, um, at least pretend that you're like in the moment. I have so much like um, that from the time I got hurt for the next couple of years, to be honest, like I, I look back on it now and I just, I, in some point, points I don't recognize myself, you know, there's just, I, I see a lot of, like, I have pride in certain things I did during that time, right? Like sticking through it and, you know, like overcoming injury. I still have, you know, I suffered a spinal cord injury, you know, so I call it the ACL syndrome. When I talk with people, they're like, hey, how's, how's it going? Or, what percentage are you? And, you know, I just say, like, oh, well, I'm forever hurt. Yeah. And they're like, don't think about it that way. You, you, and you're going, no, that's just how it is, right? And I was also just getting older, apparently. And so I just look back on it, and there's some blurry times yeah. uh, of my life during that time. Um, I didn't have a campaign manager. Um, I didn't actually run much of a campaign. Got some donations, bought some hats, ran some ads. All the debates at that time, to your point, were on Zoom, right. which was like a super strange, artificial kind of interaction. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to tell you that, like, one of the number one reasons that I was interested in having this conversation tonight is that regardless of politics and circumstances, I've always felt like I owed you an apology. Um, there's two different interactions I had with you at that time. And one of them was I should have just minded my own business. And I really mean that, like, you were dealing with things. And so, you know, to your point, I, I just feel like it was a mistake on my behalf at that time. You know, I made one comment on social media. What do you know? Like, don't press send. And, uh, and I did, you know, and it was convenient. And I did not have the rest of the information, right? And I've always regretted that just personally. So truly, regardless of the wizard and everybody else here, um, I regret pressing send on that because um, it, I didn't know the totality of the circumstances and especially the intensity of that set of circumstances. Um, and the rest of it was, I was used to politics. I was used to teaching politics, dissecting politics, raised in a highly political family. But I have to admit, looking back, that I had never been in politics. And I've been a high school principal. You know, I've been a classroom teacher. There's plenty of politics in those realms, right? Like tons. So I thought, man, I'm good. You know, nothing's, you know, thick skin. But I was confronted during 2020, um, not specifically by you at all, but just the, the thing that is modern American campaigns. Um, and I, was, I got very upset. Um, thought I was mischaracterized as, as being a conservative because I was more conservative than liberals. You know, so I said, just because I'm more conservative than you doesn't make me a conservative. And it's, it's funny because I, I, my one thing I think about walking away from there is that you, you, like you could judge me exactly who I am like all day long, but I, I still uh, struggle with this idea of like when you're um, characterized as somebody you're not. Mm -hmm. 
right? Like you're just like, just judge me 100% right here, right now. But like that, I'm just not that. And so, um, yeah, it, it doesn't make me want to run again. And um, I really mean it. It's like, it's intense. It's really hard on our families, the people who care about us, um, which is why I like small step um, with just a little bit of this point about being, it doesn't have to be so poisonous and caustic. So uh, we can, we've already agreed to go to talk another time about the rest, you know, because there's a lot more there. But right. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. What do you want me to know about you, Jim? <laughs> this now seems like speed dating or something. Like that. It's like, <laughs> and I thought earlier, I'm like, it's also like egoic, you know, it's like, if it's more about me, right? I, you know, there's really not much. Like, I, I think the, my number one answer to this question is what I just said to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted you to know that. I also wanted you to know that um, I think there's, we may have some ideological differences. We might have some differences on how to accomplish uh, specific things. But what I would want you to know about me is I watched you as mayor for four years and there's not a huge long list. There are some things, of course, but there's not some huge long list. And what I want you to know about me is that I appreciate the second mistake I made with regards to you personally is when I was being sworn in uh, to become a town councilor and you were on the way out as the mayor, I didn't, this is it's embarrassing to me, it's like so petty, I didn't clap for you, right? I didn't recognize just the fact that regardless of our different political ideologies and thoughts and whatever, that I didn't honor your service. And I regret that as well. So I, I mentioned that there's two things, and it's important for me um, to communicate those two things. So what I want you to know about me is that I do honor your service. I do. And I, I recognize you a man of incredible intelligence, incredible skill set, um, including a love for old country music. And um, I just want you to know that I don't harbor any like ill will, and I hope you forgive me from you know, my trespasses and I hope that we can, you know, there, there was a time that I would have described us as friends. We had, we had we're friends because like Jackson friends because we have so many common friends that by definition we're friends, right? <laughs> and so I would, I would meet Pete, you know, I think I, was, I think I was really early on in your Jackson history as far as Maddie Combs' backyard. Yeah, yeah. I think you lived there in a camper, um, which is, <laughs> or maybe, true. Oh, that was Chip. That was, a, that, was another, that was another 30 friends of mine. Different and, um, but, you know, just hoping that this can be the start of just, because I'd love to hear your thoughts on a multitude of different things having to do with this community moving forward. I specifically appreciated your stance on climate change and housing. And I'd like to talk with you more and learn, learn from you about that. I'm happy to anytime. And then what do you want me to know about you? Well, I, I, there's, I guess after four years of being mayor, there's not a whole lot, especially you probably, you probably ran an ops campaign. <laughs> no, no, all my bad, all my dirty secrets, everything. No, I, I would say the one thing that I, right now having, having had this conversation that I would say is that, you know, I ran a, a campaign in 2016 and, um, that was a nasty, is just as nasty a campaign. There were people who were acting as surrogates for me, and I'm not going to say who they were, but there were there was a lot of stuff going on, and there were things that I thought of uh, former elected officials, and and maybe one in particular that I thought them in good faith, but they were not true. And my understanding of how the system worked, um, having like yourself, not being not been inside it, not seen how it was done, um, was wrong frankly, and uh, I regret, and I have said this before, um, but I think in this context it's important, I, I regret things that I said and I regret, regret things that I did during that campaign. It doesn't matter if they were done in good faith or not, right? They're, it's, it's something to, you know, I don't know how we kind of escape from that because we're, 
you know, we want people to feel empowered to run for public office, and yet they've never done it. And there's no roadmap for doing it. Um, and we're, you know as well as I do how much stress it can be to run a campaign. You're, in, you're, you're under the microscope every moment, you're in the public eye, you're going from here to there, you're constantly having to think on your feet. Um, and, you know, I don't know that there's a solution to that um, other than looking back and saying, I wouldn't do that again, right? Yeah. Which I can do and, and you can do too now, right? Yeah. But, but I, I guess what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that I, I understand. I get it, you know, I understand how, how something like that can happen, how we can get caught up in the moment and do things we would not otherwise do, and that's, that's the nature of the beast. So I don't hold grudges over things like that, and um, I, think it's, I think it's important that somebody else is gonna run a campaign <laughs> next year, yeah. and they're, they're gonna be somebody who's never been in a campaign before, has never, or, or has, but hasn't actually been in office and seen how things work, and they're gonna do the same things, and we ought to have, you know, in our own hearts that same, Kind of understanding for what they're going through. How do you want to be remembered for your public service? Well, uh, I'm a I'm a hard worker, uh, so I guess and the two, I guess the two things I would say I'd want to be remembered for is I I showed up for for everything I, and, and I, I just just as a like a blue collar guy, I just I think I missed one meeting in four years, and um, and I, I I did I, a lot of it as you know is not that fun. Like <laughs> you sit through like how many budget meetings do you have to sit through, and you're just like oh my god, shoot me, you know. Um, so <laughs> that was uh, that was hard. You're 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 in it now. You know, like some of these are not that you know. You you get in there, and you're like I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do all this thing. But first, we've got to count plant units at a development. <laughs> you know, you're like. Uh, you know, I want to be remembered for that, but I'd say mostly on top of that, that I, I, I made mistakes, and, uh, but I always did, every, everything I did, I, I truly believed I was doing for the best of the community. I believe you're doing that, too. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, I think I, and I think most, most elected officials do that. And I, you know, I don't think there are people out there, especially at this level, who are trying to game things for themselves, you know? And I, there's that... Um, there's a, there's a perception, I think, among certain people in the community, I certainly heard it from people, um, that, oh, you're getting in it to, to get rich. I, I was kind of laughing at you earlier. You're like, oh I needed a job. I'm like, that one? But I always put the community first in all of the decisions, and, and that was not a difficult thing to do. It's just, and I, I, I've, I've seen and read enough about what you've done to know that you're doing the same thing, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I, think, I think that, more than anything, is what all elected officials, and now I'm gonna, I think I have to ask you the same question, so I shouldn't yeah. be trying to put that in your, those words in your mouth, but um, how do you want to be remembered for your public service, Jim? <laughs> well, I'm wearing my dad's bolo tie, Jim Rooks, and so he was, this question, I, I looked at it, and I'm like, you know, I don't know anybody who's trying to establish a legacy at local level <laughs> politics, right? There's, there ain't no libraries coming, right? And so um, my old man, before he passed away, we're asking him some of these questions. We're interviewing him, right? And he says his goal in life was when people bring up his name, he wanted everyone to say, whatever happened to that guy? <laughs> <laughs> and so... I've, I've held on to that, right? Which yeah. is like, I mean, if you're <laughs> trying to do something beyond, you know, that, um, I think that was his point, is just being humble and just being a servant of the community. Yeah. Um, the one thing I thought I could say is that um, I, I pride myself on being like approachable and responsive. Like if, if we look at state level government and federal level government, appreciate uh, Representative Yen being here, you know, you're just going, it's, you're, you're, if you're waiting for the call back, it's almost never gonna happen, right? <laughs> uh, and so at least I wanna be remembered as someone like, like I always pick up the phone, I respond. My colleague said I was crazy early on, saying there's no way you're gonna keep up with that volume of contacts, but I really do genuinely try to just reply to the email, reply. My rule is if, if you offend me in the first sentence and you know, insult me, I'm probably not gonna call you back, but I, I do idea. wanna be remembered as like a, a true delegate, you know, right. this democratic system based on 
not just right. me or what I think, but right. just being open and responsive to what yeah. people communicate to me. Yeah. There's a lot in the inbox, isn't there? <laughs> a lot, <laughs> yeah. And as far as getting rich, oh my God, that's a whole other conversation. You know, I, know what what I do I like know people to know is it's this common thing. I don't know if it's from the trickle down from the national level, but you know, 35 grand a year, right? I'm pretty sure I was the lowest earning hourly wage earner in my family this last summer. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I have two teenage kids. You should right? run for the cash. Yeah. <laughs> That so, minimum wage, but I'll take it earlier. Yeah, I missed that memo about how to get rich in politics. Should have run for the county commission, too. Yeah. <laughs> We're out of time, unfortunately, but I um, okay. offer you one more question. So What's something you, you'd like to take away from this experience? Just this. It would be the nonverbal for me. Like, I had a chance to talk with you before um, that I appreciate your willingness to be here. For me, it's, it's purely, like, personal. Um, for me, it's one more chance to be in front of the people with a microphone. <laughs> uh, no, it, honestly, it's just, uh, I've, I've enjoyed this. I, it's good to clear the air and, and, and know where we stand here after, you know, it's been three years. So I, I appreciate you being willing to sit down with me, and I'll, I'll take that away with, as a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you all for coming out tonight and for being willing to share your experience about one small step. So we're going to just have a few questions from Allison and I to kick it off, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And so before, if you want to take the question, just feel free to, um, to answer, but first say your name um, and maybe just a little bit about you, like how long you've lived in Jackson, maybe what you do here or where you're from, just so that we have a little bit of, of context about who you are. Um, so why don't we just start off with, uh, what is it about talking to a stranger that made one small step something you wanted to do, <clears throat> say opposed to a family member or a friend? I'm Andy Wienig, 47 years old, and uh, I've talked to a lot of strangers in my life. There was two years that I lived in Argentina as a missionary, full time. And that's what we did, was talk full time to people we didn't know to try and invite them to church. So it was pretty easy for me. Yeah, I'll just echo that. My name is Kelsey, I'm 25 years old. Um, I've lived in Jackson for almost four years and I currently work for the Sierra Club and Shelter GH. Um, I similarly am very accustomed and comfortable chatting with strangers and asking them strange questions about their political beliefs. Um, I have been door knocking and canvassing for political candidates since I was 15 years old, and it feels almost too natural to knock on a door and ask <laughs> some maybe invasive questions to folks. <laughs> My name's Emma Leiter. I'm 25. I've been here full time for about a year and a half. Um, I work for a local nonprofit, and I grew up uh, in a not a diverse political community, but where I differed my opinions and my family's opinions differed a lot from the opinions around me, so I feel like I had a lot of conversations with people that I knew about politics, but not so much strangers, and that was usually something I did not broach, so I was curious to try that. JP, do you have anything to um, My name is John Paul Trudell. Um, you may know my daughter, who is the principal at Summit High School. Pierre Angelique Trudell, and um, I basically came from the East Coast um, about 21 years ago, and um, I have a granddaughter who's studying to be a nurse in Portland, and she's doing very well. She also is an expert skier that she learned how to ski from her father, who's an um, extreme skier, and um, He's also done a lot of, he's a helicopter uh, ski man over in uh, Driggs in the wintertime. Um, but I... Okay. Uh, why did you want to talk to a stranger? Or why did you want to have a conversation? I know you're well, I think the important thing is, I'm, um, and Hillary can verify this, I, I do a lot of reading, and I like history. And I like, I like the idea that this is going to be um, 
be able to be available in the Library of Congress in 100 years. So some historian like Stephen Ambrose has uh, written several books which I have admired very much. One of them is Truman. And um, prior to me reading about the book Truman, I changed my mind about him. So I mean, hopefully um, the comments in the two sessions that I got involved with uh, will help some historian in the future figuring out, well, what did we, what were these people saying at that point in time? And I think that's the main reason why I, I um, felt it was important. Um, and so you're welcome. And, and I think the other thing, I enjoy uh, talking to people, and I do a lot, I've done a lot of train travel. I've met per, a German uh, piano player on a train in Switzerland, and he told me about a conscientious objector in the Second World War. And I, after hearing that, I thought to myself, boy, this is, I never heard this before. But I mean, this is one thing about taking in, um, breaking down your barriers and saying, well, there's somebody out there that's got a story which you've never heard about and you can take and learn. And that's the important thing is learning from one another. Well said. What was the most important takeaway from this experience for you personally? And maybe we can hear from some of the folks we haven't heard from yet. Well, the takeaway was, I think, that it was uh, quite comfortable. It wasn't um, difficult. Um, the person that I, I uh, partnered with was extremely intelligent and fun. And uh, it, uh, I think the word is it was very comfortable. Hi, Walt Escoval. I, like many people here, I have two jobs. I work at a local hotel and also a tour company. Uh, takeaways. Uh, echoing what you just said, uh, I found that we didn't have that many differences. I, I thought that the person I was going to be paired with would have met much more uh, ideological differences than me, but we ended up really agreeing on a lot of things. So, and I just wanted to touch on the earlier question, if I may, real quick. Um, I wanted to participate because I tried to reach common ground with people who may have different political beliefs than, than I do. Um, our country, I think, uh, it, it seems polarized, but in many ways, we're not that different from each other. We, we have many similar beliefs but I think that the extremes oftentimes get most of the media attention. Uh, but, you know, if you take two people, a uh, Republican and a, and a Democrat, uh, they can probably agree on a lot of things and they probably have many similar beliefs. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, so maybe I made a mistake, but I haven't participated yet. So, but I did sign up. I thought it was audience members, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think really this is a great opportunity for all of us to not just come together and talk but figure out where our differences are and how to talk to each other again without getting angry and walking away from each other. If some, one of you had a burning response to that please feel free. But I'm curious if you have thought about your conversation and your partner since then. Yeah, I remember when you sent me the recording of the whole conversation, I actually listened to all of it, um, which was really interesting to just think about that. And I think there were some things that I remember in the conversation my partner saying and me feeling this like burning desire to have a response to it and then being like, well, why do I think the way that I do? And I, I didn't have enough time in the moment to process that. But um, it, was, it was really interesting to like examine some of my beliefs more deeply. And I, I felt challenged in that conversation in ways that I wish I felt challenged in more. And I think I have too many conversations with people that feel really similarly to me. So then I'm, I'm not challenged. So I've, I've thought about it a lot, which has been fun. Uh, 
I personally blacked out. <laughs> so I don't remember a lot of the conversation from my own memory. <laughs> uh, so I did go back and listen, and I think I was, I was struck by just how much we have in common versus we have different from one another. I think a lot of folks in this community have very similar values and want to see the same achievements and end goals. We just have different ways of getting there. And having a conversation with an individual who ran for office last year in a political office that I do not personally, or a political party that I do not personally subscribe to was really illuminating. I think um, we certainly bonded over our commonalities and, and while we identified distinctions or differences, it wasn't in a, a negative or an aggressive light. It was, this is why I think the way I do and not at all closing off space for others to think differently. And I think that was really the most impactful thing looking back on it. We often say that a one small step conversation is just that, it's, it's one step. And so I'm curious, what is the next step for you? And how are you gonna continue this work? Or if you are going to continue this work? Run for office. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I can tie that question a little bit in with the previous question. My next step is uh, to have coffee with the person that, uh, the partner in the one small step uh, meeting that we had. So, you know, I wonder about his family, how he's doing, his challenges. Uh, I see him as, you know, just a person in this community like me. And I'm interested in how he's doing despite any differences that we may have. You know, I respect him and, and that's my next step. Mark Hauser was the partner for me. He's not here this evening, but if anybody else doesn't know him, he is very active and volunteering for the community and helping other people. And that, I would hopefully speak on his behalf, only having met him that one time, but he's already taking the next steps right now, setting an example for us to continue helping and bringing the community together and helping the people in our community. So he's a good example for me, so I hope to follow his example. Any questions, any questions from the audience? Have you ever considered this question, what color do you bleed? The question was, have you ever considered the question, what color do you bleed? Is that right, Johnny? Yeah. Okay. Yes. When I moved to Teton County, I was bleeding red. And after making friends here, I bleed blue. <laughs> <laughs> But I still identify with a very red heritage, and uh, that definitely came out in the conversation of you know recognizing the upbringing that I had, the influence that my parents had on me, and then what my social group influences me for, and then who am I, what do I think? So it was pretty self-reflective for me. Were there any conversations that were contentious? No. Um, we've had 15 of these so far, and I'll be there. People have passionate opinions. Um, when you talk about why you believe them, your personal experience that shaped that, I think it's hard to to push back against that. You know, we respect one another's ex life experiences, um, and so that's I think how these conversations are different, and I think that's what makes them work. One thing. And I really believe in we have more things in common with one another than we think we 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 put barriers in front of us to prevent an interchange. And um, that is the biggest thing in in living with one another is to remove the barriers and um, accept some truths. We're not all evil, we're not all good. We're in a combination of them. Uh, lives have produced this person who is sometimes, you know, that sometimes I, I am surprised at myself. Um, I have a friend of mine who is a trained meteorologist from MIT, and 
he and I don't agree about climate change, and I don't think it's occurring. And my basic reasoning is, I don't think we understand the power of the heat that's in the ocean, in these sink, heat sinks. I don't think we've done enough research. Um, one of the funniest things, not funny, but I mean just an observation. Um, I was very fortunate. Uh, my doctor invited me on a road trip, and we did 1,200 miles in three days. Cheyenne, Rollins, Cheyenne, and back to Salt Lake and to the Golden Spike. And that's how I felt I was there. The ghosts were all around me from 100 years ago. 1869 is when they met at the, um, the Golden Spike. And if you get a chance, it's about 40 miles off of I-15. The signs are there, but it's worth going to. And also, there's um, history being made down there. There was a company down there in um, Utah called Flycall. They made solid fuel rocket boosters. So just down the road, and these are the ones that go down by train to Cape Canaveral and then are strapped on a, a NASA uh, rocket and they go into space. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's a crazy day. Uh, you know, 1869 to 1923, I think that's right. But I mean, um, and the National Geographic just had a picture of the, of the cycle lighting off. And the reason why it's 40 miles off the road, it makes a tremendous noise. And it's also very few people around there. And it's uh, the issue about space. Um, if you get a chance to read it, it's, it's a cycle. And um, it just, is, just was a wonderful trip. And um, I just had a wonderful, uh, the doctor was very kind to me. And I uh, saw a lot of Union Pacific action. Thank you and, for uh, sharing that story. Cheyenne. But I mean. Um, Any other, other audience qu questions? What? Any other questions for the audience, from the audience? So do you find that uh, more people than you might expect are not very good listeners? They're more interested in uh, I'm sorry, conveying yeah. their own information. What? And when you're finished, then they'll get to whatever they wanted to do. But listening is maybe a, kind of a, a rare art. Do you find that? I think that's a very good question. A lot of people do just want, especially with you know, a lot of social media these days, it's very, you know, very quick interactions and you want to move on. Uh, so being able to listen is a, I think, a developed skill. It takes time. And I was at Big O Tires recently, uh, getting my tires changed. And uh, this older gentleman, he, he's a local resident, been here 55 years. And uh, we quickly struck up a conversation. And I found myself listening quite a bit. I just let him talk. And he was telling me all about the history of the area and what he'd done. and. I could tell that we had some different political beliefs, but I ended up listening mainly to him. So it's, it's a skill, I really think so. Yeah, I had a, um, uh, we're talking about next steps in this to some degree and listening. And I had a, a conflict occur um, two weeks ago with a person that I couldn't really see and I could hear them and uh, basically I hearken back to what a regret it was that we couldn't sit down and um, see one another. And so um, the next steps for me was kind of recognizing where the loggerhead was and the difficulties and I really felt badly about the conflict. It was just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but the key was that there was no possibility to interact uh, in any other way other than aggression. I think we had a question in the back of the room. Um, does this thing work? Um, actually, tonight I thought I was coming to a poetry gathering. So it's really interesting <laughs> that that's, <laughs> seriously, a friend of mine said there was a poetry gathering. So I'm like, this is kind of new. Um, and I brought another friend with me. 
just to see what it was about. Um, but the question I have is about the conversations that you guys have all had. In, was that a common question, a, a certain specific question or theme, or were they all different conversations? I don't really completely know the format of that. So does, As the person who facilitated all of the conversations like you saw tonight, um, I have a list of questions to pull from uh, that are on little fun playing cards that I would lay out for people as the conversation unfolded, I would choose different cards along the way. So yeah, some conversations I steered in one direction or another, knowing a little bit about their backstories. Okay. Yeah, I felt that um, with the questions that were provided that we were to ask each other, that you couldn't have a surface conversation. It had to go deep right away. And there, the time was limited. But you just um, don't get to sit down and have a deep, meaningful conversation inside of 20 minutes without the guidance uh, that they provided. Any other questions or? I was just curious when you said we're f only f of one of five radio stations in the country. So how did you get chosen? Uh, we applied. Um, so StoryCorps had reached out um, to a, a bunch of stations and we submitted an application sometime last fall. I don't actually really remember because a lot's happened since then. But we were notified in um, maybe February that we got it. So, Thank you all so much. This has been so refreshing and so needed in, um, in our community or else, anywhere. Um, but my question is, is that I struggle with when you come up against where you don't even, can't, you can't even agree on the basic facts or information. And I'm wondering if that ever came up in conversations um, or the questions were steered so that you went beyond that pretty quickly. But how do you deal with uh, when you just can't even agree on basic facts? I think a big focus of the way that this program is structured is around lived experience and not around facts and data. And I think that is the condition that provides our ability to set those things aside, right? Is, is taking away the numbers and the data that we are constantly um, overwhelmed with that is often extremely divisive. I think starting as a baseline, talking about where you come from and how you've developed your beliefs inherently sets you on a path to talk about these conceptual ideas and, and imagined realities and maybe um, step outside of that kind of fact-bound world that we often find ourselves stuck in. Um, and while I think there are drawbacks to relying specifically or exclusively on lived experience versus data, um, I think there's a role for both. And I think, especially in this experience, that being able to talk authentically about what you know best, which is yourself and your life and your experiences, without having the burden of providing proof or providing data was really freeing for me um, and helped me explore my personal positions as well as those of my partner alongside the context of that data that you can kind of add in yourself almost. I think it created a fuller conversation even though it kind of excluded that um, maybe statistical and, and quantitative analysis that we often resort to. Well, one of, my, one of our expressions in our society in the last several years has been, well, we live in flyover country, and our leaders go from coast to coast or sea to sea, and they don't get a chance to talk to the average person. It's, it's six hours in a seat, and uh, they, they may talk to the person sitting next to them, but this, it, I think the main problem why this is going to occur, and uh, is this going to be done in other parts of the country? Yes, the program's going to continue. It started in um, 2021, I believe, and there's been a couple thousand, probably 
almost 4,000 people that have participated so far around the country. And the idea is that it's gonna continue every year and there'll be new stations and new communities that this goes to. Well, I think this whole session will be of great importance to a historian in 100 years as to how the average person, and I think, I don't like to use the word average, but I mean, the common folk. <laughs> I mean, we're not politicians. We're not being quoted in the newspaper every day or on interviewed on the radio on some important decision. But I mean, I think this program, and I, which I enjoyed, we, you know, we've got to break the barriers down and hopefully this has played over the national uh, broadcasting system. Of, uh, and it, a person sitting in the car in the morning is going to listen to one of these sessions and say, you know, I never thought of that. So we are broadcasting um, a bunch of these conversations on um, K-12 on 89.1, um, and then they're also featured in our weekly or bi-weekly podcast called Jackson Unpacked. You can find that wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and actually, we're going to wrap it up tonight with um, another little snippet, it's very short, I promise, of a conversation from a participant who uh, recently passed away. So we wanted to pay a little tribute to her, Joanne Goldberg. Yeah, this conversation was between JP uh, and Joanne Goldberg, uh, who were both residents at Sage Living Center. Uh, so they were not strangers to one another, but they were quite different in their political beliefs. If you're willing to listen and ask the right questions, you can see how they look at life. Right. You know. I value other people's opinions on everything. Is there something about my beliefs you don't agree with, but still respect? Yeah. We live in a free country, thank God. And I respect your right to feel the way you do. And I hope people respect my right to feel the way I do. I think we're on the same wavelength. I think we've had enough life experiences that we don't have to knock on the, over with a rubber mallet. But I mean, this is a, a life that I never expected, and here I am. Do you ever feel, ever feel misunderstood by people with different beliefs than you? No. I mean, you know, I'm pretty open about how I feel, and I don't feel misunderstood. I mean, people know who I am and what I am. Mm -hmm. This is Joanne's bio. I was born and raised on a farm in South Carolina, raised Christian. I've been married twice, first to a Catholic and then to a Jewish man. I converted to Judaism. I have one son. I was an ambitious child and started working in high school and went to work in a law firm as a secretary, later a paralegal in Atlanta. Learned about a law in his career and switched gears into real estate. So you read the paper, the free paper, and the back page, and you look at these houses, and you're saying, boy, I never sold houses this much. <laughs> well, I was very fortunate. I really thought I would enjoy real estate sales, and I went for it, and honey, it was the greatest decision of my life because it was very, uh, mm, how can I say, uh, profitable. <laughs> As I get older, you know, I think more about my family back in South Carolina, and I got tons of aunts and uncles and cousins and outlaws and in-laws. That's right. They're all Republicans. <laughs> I got to get back there and take them to a Democratic school, my school. <laughs> 